Alexander Hefner, your new host on The Open Mind. The Founding Fathers have long been memorialized as the infallible spiritual guides of America. While they continue to be revered, in recent decades the Founders have been the subject of more nuanced and dispassionate evaluation. And no living historian has more dramatically enriched the course of contemporary scholarship concerning these men and their era than today's guest. The Charles Warren Professor of American Legal History at Harvard Law School and the Carol Fortzheimer Professor of Advanced Studies at the Radcliffe Institute, Annette Gordon-Reed has become the authority not only on the Thomas Jefferson-Sally Hemings relationship, but also on the legacy, sensibility, and politics of our brilliant yet hypocritical third president, who owned more than 100 slaves when he declared all men to be equal. When she first critiqued the historiography of Jefferson's liaison with Sally Hemings, Annette Gordon-Reed exposed biases in the analysis of primary source material that actually invited the very real possibility that Hemings and Jefferson engaged in a romantic relationship. A 1998 DNA study of genetic paternity confirmed Gordon-Reed's conclusion that Jefferson had in fact fathered children with Hemings. Her exploration of the four generations of those children the Hemingses of Monticello, an American family, won both, both the Pulitzer Prize and the National Book Award. My guest is now exploring the more up-to-date lineage of the Hemings family. She then plans a biography of Jefferson that will illuminate his life as a slaveholder. As cases of sexual scandal ensnaring our elected officials persist, Gordon Reed's investigative lens is ever relevant, as is her illumination of America's moral complexity and we're all eager for updates from the archival trail of Annette Gordon-Reed. But first, since her work originally challenged historians' dismissal of slave perspectives, I want to ask her if she believes a more objective approach has been achieved throughout the profession, and if current readers have found her reappraisals to humanize or dehumanize Jefferson. Professor Annette Gordon-Reed, are we more outraged by him or more sympathetic? With Jefferson. Well, I think it depends on who you are. I think people who are predisposed to being, uh, to sort of liking Jefferson, will find it a more humanistic portrait, and people who are predisposed to demonize him will go the other way. I, I suppose there are some people in the middle who might be swayed, but I found that most people, and as a matter of fact, someone did a, a survey about this and asked people if the stories about Hemings changed their view of Jefferson, and in the high 90s, people said no. Um, because I think most people, if not most historians uh, of the past, but most people understood that this was a part of slavery, uh, that these kinds of liaisons happened. And the real problem is being a slave owner, that to the extent that you have a problem with Jefferson, that that's it, not this aspect of his life that was an integral part of, of that institution. And do you think there still is a double standard in the historiography or in our more contemporary American political consciousness? Well, I think... The historiography of slavery, I've often said this, is like the crown jewel of American historiography. I think people have done, uh, for the past, I would say, 40 or 50 years, a pretty good job of trying to bring the perspectives of enslaved people into the history. The difficulty with Jefferson is that he was uh, a singular figure, so it was like everything was moving around him, but that particular historiography that was uh, under the control, pretty much, of biographers and biographers who were you know, came of age before, you know, the Civil Rights Movement even. Uh, Duma Malone, who wrote the majestic six-volume biography of Jefferson, was born around the turn of the century and um, had, and was a Southerner and had the kinds of sensibilities that you would expect um, from a man of that time. But I do think that the job overall of writing about slavery has been wonderful. It's just that in this particular thing, there was, a, there was a problem. And I think we've moved beyond that now with the aid of historians, but also Monticello the Thomas Jefferson Foundation, people who visit Monticello today have a very, very different experience than they would have had 20 years ago. So things have gotten better. And your work obviously is credited with that transformation of mindset. And let's, let me ask you, based on your research, is there any indication that Jefferson had misgivings about his role as a slave owner? Um, 
Yes, I think that there are indications, certainly even notes in the state of Virginia that's notorious for his comments about race. He makes it very plain that he uh, had misgivings and that sl thought slavery was wrong. In his memorandum books, as a, as a younger man, even before he becomes a public figure, he copies out, actually I should say his commonplace book, he copies out uh, a poem um, about the evils of the slave trade. And this is not something that's done for public consumption. It was a thing people used to do clippings very often of things that impressed them and they thought were important. And so this is an indication that even as a young man, he saw himself as anti-slavery or, or, or had a, a critique of the institution that he nevertheless lived in. But he never demonstrated himself any culpability for perhaps his own role as a slaveholder in, or insofar as uh, his um, relationship with Sally Hemings and fathering children who he kept in mm -hmm. bondage. Mm -hmm. He never was public about that and he never in, in any materials um, addressed that. No, no, he never, slave owners who were involved with in, in slave women, it was not, sex was not a topic that people talked about and they certainly didn't write about it um, to family members in any, any kind of way that would be known. I mean, I should say uh, William Byrd has a very famous, uh, he's not of Jefferson's generation, a diary in which he is, sort of a coded diary when she talks about sex and so forth. But for the most part, this was a red, very reticent era about putting those kinds of things down. No, he did not. And most in, uh, slave owners who had children with enslaved women uh, kept that secret, and he did as well. Um, kept it secret in the sense that it's not something that he talked about. I, I do find it interesting that um, the children were named for people who were his favored relatives and friends. And so in that sense, um, as sort of a marking of them in a way uh, that people in Virginia would have understood because people know, you know, names are very, very important in terms of genealogy and so forth. And so um, that's the only thing that, uh, well, one of the most public things that he could do would be to give them names that people would have understood the significance of. And to take a step back from that, can you tell us how Sally Hemings came to Paris and how she ultimately forged a relationship uh, with our third president? Um, Sally Hemings came to Paris um, accompanying Jefferson's younger daughter. He had gone a few years earlier to be uh, on, a, on a, a mission there for the United States. He actually became the minister to France after Franklin uh, gave up uh, after eight years and came home. Um, Jefferson left his youngest daughter with his sister-in-law, who was in this very con convoluted Virginia world, was also Sally Hemings' half-sister because Jefferson's wife and Sally Hemings were half-siblings. Uh, so he left them there. She was a companion to Jefferson's daughters. And when one of Jefferson's daughters died, um, he decided he wanted the other daughter brought to him in Paris. And he asked to have a middle-aged woman accompany them. Um, he ends up, well, they ended up sending Sally Hemings instead of the older woman, and she's about 14 at this time, so uh, the girl that she's accompanying is nine, and so she's the 14-year-old babysitter for a nine-year-old, uh, which was not uncommon during that time period uh, in, in the South. That's a role that a slave, young slave children played, young slave girls. So she comes to Paris. First, she stops off in London. Um, they stop off at the home of John and Abigail Adams. Um, and they stay there for a couple of weeks, and then Jefferson sends a servant to pick them up, and then she comes to Paris. Uh, Abigail Adams had actually thought that she should have been sent back home because she was actually too young to take care of, of uh, Patsy, excuse me, Polly, that's the younger daughter. Uh, but for whatever reason, Jefferson doesn't think that's a good idea, and it, it probably was not a good idea to send a teenage girl back on a ship with a bunch of sailors by herself uh, on a long ocean voyage. And so she comes to Paris uh, in 1787, in August of 1787. And what are the circumstances under which she forges this relationship over time? I know in, in your book mm -hmm. you illuminate and, and give great texture to this um, mm -hmm. culture and, and really her lifestyle, which was not one of a slave when mm -hmm. she was in Paris. Mm -hmm. Well, Paris in Paris, the situation was, uh, her, her status was, I don't want to say ambiguous. I mean, it, you could petition, slaves could petition for freedom in France, and everybody who petitioned for freedom in the 18th century got it. So it was sort of a pro forma thing. So she and her brother, who had come over, James, who had come over with Jefferson originally, they could have been free when they were there. They could have petitioned um, for their freedom uh, when they were in France. Uh, Jefferson, 
began the policy of paying people, and he sort of kept this up later on when he came back to the United States, when he had enslaved people mixed with free workers um, outside of Monticello, he paid people a salary. So she, uh, wages, I should say, is more appropriate. Sally Hemings and James Hemings were paid wages. And one of the things that I found out in the book was that they were paid pretty good wages. They were paid at the sort of higher end uh, for the types of jobs that they would have been doing. And so here's a person who's a slave in Virginia, comes to a place where she can, in fact, be free um, and is getting wages. So it's a very, very different kind of lifestyle. And um, we don't have Sally Hemings's words on this, but you can only, I mean, something like that could only change a person's sensibilities uh, and understandings about her possibilities in her life. And she agreed to travel back with uh, mm -hmm. Thomas Jefferson. Well, and, and the sort of change in her circumstances, um, her son, their son recollects that, or his recollections say that she wanted to stay there um, because she would have been free there. And Jefferson promised her a nice life if she would come back and that any children they had would be freed when they were grown. They would live with them and then go away when they were adults. And she decided to do that. And people always ask me, you know, why did she do that? And there could have been any number of reasons. If you, one of the dilemmas in slavery is that do you leave your family behind and seek your own freedom? Um, you could be free, but the rest of your family is still in bondage. And so it's not, a, it's not an easy question. So it could have been she wanted to come back with him. It could have been, and I talk a lot about this in the book, how close this family was. Uh, that the thought of leaving her mother and her all of her siblings behind was not something that she wanted to do. And his promises um, that she and her their son says that she relied on uh, were enough inducement to get her to come back. And that promise of freedom for her children at the age of 21, right? Mm -hmm. And do you think that also implies more than historians initially understood the possibility of a truly romantic, um, substantive relationship between Sally and Thomas? Well, um, it's, that's a tough question uh, because for, in, in this particular world, a slave owner who was considered to be a decent slaveholder, freeing the children that you had with the woman was the thing that decent slo slave owners did. I, I think the characterization of it is romantic. I know what you're getting at. Is, is it, this is some sort of authentic thing. Do these people have some sort of connection? Um, we don't really know about her. I mean, she does come back, and I say that there are lots of reasons she could have come back with him that beyond, oh, I'm in love with Thomas Jefferson, is that I want to get back to Virginia and be with my family and face whatever we're going to face together. Um, I've said I don't find it likely that he had a purely sexual interest in her for 38 years. So from his standpoint, I don't see um, an issue with the idea of attachment because obviously he could have done something else. I mean, but the freeing of the children is, that's something that slave owners, you know, I mean, not all slave owners did, most of them didn't. Uh, most of the people who had children with enslaved women didn't do that. But the ones who saw themselves as being, <laughs> they started to use these terms, uh, decent in, this, in these kinds of circumstances, that's what they did. You referred to Monticello before. Have they embraced um, more fully in the 21st century this idea of a multicultural Thomas Jefferson? Uh, a multicultural Thomas Jefferson? I don't know about that. They have certainly embraced slavery as an important topic. And it's sort of, you wonder, how could people have not? You, it's, Monticello is a slave plantation. You can, it's right. easy to, uh, to forget that when you're up there on top of the mountain because the fields were, are gone now and they would have been way down the mountain. And you see this nice house with all the gadgets in it and the hidden rooms and the weird staircases. And you focus in on Jefferson. But they have, over the years, since really 19, the early 1990s, understood that to tell the real story and history of, of Monticello and of Virginia in that period, you have to talk about slavery. So they have a plantation community tour. Uh, even when you do a tours of the house, they, are, they have to mention slavery in every room. Mm. So it's never far away. I'm not so sure lots of, sometimes visitors are, uh, some, some category of visitors are upset by that. Mm. Uh, don't want to be reminded that, that this was a, a slave plantation and there were slaves there. They've certainly, 
um, embrace the Hemings story in the film that you do at the visitor center. They say that historians now believe that all of her children were fathered by Jefferson, and they have in the visitor center a um, large family tree of the Hemingses, and Jefferson is on it as the father of Sally Hemings' children. So that's been a sea change mm. in their understanding of, of, and their presentation of life at Monticello. How do you think this question of slavery weighed uh, in his personal life, but also Thomas Jefferson, in some of his writings feared the idea of a slave rebellion or mm -hmm. Southerner's idea of an uprising um, among the enslaved. Do you think that factored into why he was not um, as fervently abolitionist in spirit mm -hmm. later in his life? Is that, is that one of the crux of why? I think he made his peace with slavery. One of the things, I'm working on a book now with uh, Peter Onuf, uh, who is the Thomas Jefferson Foundation professor at, uh, at UGA. He's emeritus now. And we're doing a book about Jefferson. And we're talking a lot, of, we're going to be talking a lot about slavery. And one of the things that we, we talk about is Jefferson making his peace with slavery in, in France and, and coming back and deciding that he's going to be a good slave owner, that he's going to ameliorate uh, the condition of enslaved people. Um, I think he felt that this was a project, this is a thing that p exasperates people about Jefferson, that this was a project for the future, for the next generation would handle this. His generation had founded the country um, and put it on a track and time and progress would yield an answer to the, to the slavery question. I do think he felt um, concerned, and he says this in the notes in the state of Virginia about what happens when there's emancipation. He felt that blacks would never forgive whites for what they had done and there would be a race war. And he felt that and a lot of other people felt it too. And you can kind of see how they would. I mean, if you are in this system that you have some inkling is wrong, you think you're doing wrong to people, you sort of, he wouldn't have thought of it in terms of transference, that's a, that's a Freudian <laughs> kind of thing. Uh, but the idea is that how would I act if I were in this situation? Uh, and the anger and resentment, he thought, would spill over into conflict. So his response to freedom and a dagger, as he said in the letter to mm -hmm. John Adams, was incrementalism? Mm -hmm. Incrementalism. He was a man of the Enlightenment, and the Enlightenment has its good points and its bad points. And one of them is that it allowed people to sort of, people like him who had other preoccupations. I, I've said this, Jefferson was preoccupied with the founding of the United States and the continuance of the Union uh, and of the United States, the Federal Union that was put together. He was not obsessed with slavery. He was not obsessed with race. These are things that interest us. And we could say he should have been if he had understood how these things would, the role that they would play in the dissolution of the Union he might have paid more attention to it, but he thought that this is a problem that will solve itself uh, in the way that people who, are, who believe in progress uh, and believe and sort of idealistic, that of course, of course this is gonna go away, but he, not realizing that sometimes you actually have to, very often, most of the time, you have to take action to do it. You can't leave it to other people, but he felt you know, that, look, I've done my part and he was obsessed to the end of his life with this idea of, of his role in the revolution and the importance of the revolution, not just for American history, but for world history. Do you think he saw it coming to a head in, in the Civil War? Well, the Missouri crisis, and the, he wrote a letter to John Holmes, and he get, gives the famous phrase of fire bell in the night, that that crisis uh, about bringing Missouri into the Union as a slave state. Um, was uh, the first inkling that he had uh, that this could end, and he talks in this letter, he sort of suggests that this is gonna could lead to bloodshed and the dissolution of the Union, and he was in agony about that because as a Southerner, his reaction was to, um, instinctive reaction is to go with what the Southerners wanted, but then people sort of assume from that that how, what position he would have taken in the Civil War, um, but on the other hand, he hated the idea of America being drawn into European power politics, and the surefire way of doing that would have been to have the dissolution of the Union, and that's what happened. You know, the South tries to get the aid of England, whom he hated. I mean, you just think of what he would have responded to if he had, in fact, lived to see that, if he'd been present at that moment, to see a region of the United States ask for help from, um, 
the very nation he hated so much and this whole idea of being drawn into those kinds of power politics, it would have been terrible for him. So, you know, he's a, a unionist to protect the United States, but he was a states' rights and a southerner um, because he was concerned about encroachment of the federal government. And turning back to the Hemingses now, his grandchildren, mm -hmm. at least two of them, right, mm -hmm. uh, participated in the war as Union officers. Yes. Um, two of his uh, grandchildren with, uh, from Sally Hemings' line uh, participated uh, in the, uh, well, actually three of them from two branches. Madison Hemings' sons were um, in the Union Army. They were black. They identified as black, but they actually because they looked white and everybody in the town would have known that they were actually, you know, considered black, joined a white regiment and participated. Um, the Eston Hemings line, who had moved into the white world, uh, John Wales Jefferson became a lieutenant colonel and fought at Vicksburg and was wounded at Vicksburg and he sent back lots of dispatches from the battle. Um, his grandson with his wife, George With Randolph, was for a time the Secretary of the Confederacy. So you have hem descendants on both sides and on both sides of the color line. Hmm. That's interesting. How do you think um, that, that Jefferson foresaw, if, if he had any imagination, of what would happen if the country were to res be resurrected in a, in a more color neutral, racial neutral way? Mm -hmm. did, did, did any of his philosophy speak to that? None at all, because he, the liberal position, and this is hard for us to imagine uh, in this time period, the liberal position at the time was emancipation and expatriation, because there was no vision, no idea that he could express that blacks and whites could live together after what had happened over the past couple of centuries with slavery. Um, and also, uh, strangely enough, he said, the fear of intermixture, even though he knew very well that slavery uh, provided an opportunity for intermixture as well. And he I think, had participated and exactly, but the difference is it would be black men and white women. And there's a gender and a patriarchy issue here as well in his understanding of, of, of what would happen after this. So here's what I wanted to ask you this whole interview, and I'm dying to ask you this. In the more recent lineage um, of Hemingses, mm -hmm. um, has there any uh, dialogue been recorded? between the Hemingses and later figures, either radical Republicans or uh, civil rights leaders. In your, in your more up-to-date mm -hmm. research, mm -hmm. the grandchildren mm -hmm. from um, Eston Hemings mm -hmm. and, and beyond, mm -hmm. uh, did, did they have any uh, conversation or involvement in abolitionism and civil rights beyond emancipation? Well, uh, the Madison Hemings line definitely did. Uh, Frederick Madison Roberts uh, was, became a very, very prominent newspaper man. He was the first uh, California, black California legislator, and he was very active in civil rights policies and was a noted campaigner against birth of the nation and was a very, very prominent civil rights person. So they, he, they were very active in it. And there were other members, branches of the Hemings family. W William Monroe Trotter uh, was a Hemings. Um, who was partially founded the Niagara Movement with W.E.B. Du Bois and was very, very prominent in Boston. These are not, I mean, the Frederick Madison Roberts is, is a direct descendant of Jefferson, but the other members of the Hemings family were also prominent members. In Did they have any interaction with Charles Sumner or Thaddeus Stevens or people? Not that I, not that I know of, not that I've found yet, mm -hmm. but on their own right, they, one of the mm -hmm. things that Senator Stanton says is that that generation, uh, the people, the black people from Monticello fought the hardest in some ways to keep Jefferson's uh, words alive in the Declaration, all men are created equal. They took that very much to heart and then sort of set about trying to make that a reality. Mm -hmm. I wonder, do you think having an articulate uh, and accomplished two-term president of color has further reversed this double standard or do you think it might have exacerbated it or has it, has it had any effect on the, the historiographical approach that you see yourself or others taking in the field? I don't, I don't, it, that, that's left to be seen. I mean, that's a question, I mean, I deal with the past and that's a uh, prognostication we have to see in the future for that. I do think it's been a tur obviously a turning point in the country because many people never thought that this would happen. I didn't think this was gonna happen anytime soon and when it happened, we were happy. But then on the other side, there were a lot of people who thought this would not happen in their lifetime and it did happen and they're very, very unhappy. And so some of the reaction to this president, it's pretty clear 
uh, that is sort of expo has exposed a lot of latent racism um, and a lot of latent um, adherence to white supremacy, the belief in white supremacy that this somehow challenges that and challenges what this country is about. So it's, go it's going to be interesting to see what the fallout is. Mm. And lastly, your newest book out in 2015 mm -hmm. uh, explores Jefferson's character. Mm -hmm. Give us a little tidbit um, what you're going to illuminate um, in that. Well, we, that. we hope we take, it's a thematic approach. We're talking about Jefferson as a slaveholder, Jefferson in music, ways that show how he you know, sort of try to discern what he thought he was doing in his life. What can we, and we're sort of taking Jefferson at his own word, which hasn't, happened in quite some time now and people are pretty much second guessing all of these things but to sort of start fresh and try to draw a what we think is a more complete picture of him. Thank you so much Annette Gordon-Reed. You're very welcome. I hope you'll come back I when you publish that book. Lots of fun. Great. Thank you. And thanks to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time in pursuit of intellectual vigilance for a modern age. Until then, keep an open mind. Please visit the Open Mind website at 13.org slash Open Mind to view this program or to access over 1,500 other Open Mind interviews.